I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, for everyone both the committee members that will participate on this panel as well as the panel participants. Um, Honorable Judge John Gerard, uh, Mr. Chip Friendsley, Mr. Ruben Kahn, and the Honorable Dale Fisher will be our committee members. And our panel participants are Ms. Corey Harbor Valdez from the Western District of Texas, and my understanding also from the District of New Mexico. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Richard Esper from the Western District of Texas, uh, Mr. Philip Sapian from the District of New Mexico, and Ms. Melanie Morgan from the District of Kansas. Um, we're going to start with opening statements, so we'll start with, start with you, Ms. Harbor Valdez. Thank you, Your Honor, and thank you to the committee for allowing us to be here this afternoon and participate in this very important study that you've undertaken. Just a little bit about my background. I have had my own firm since 2004, in which I practice civil and criminal appeals and criminal defense. I do have the privilege of serving on both panels for the Western District of Te Texas El Paso Division and the District of New Mexico. Currently about 50% of my cases are CJA panel appointments and that's both at the trial level and the appellate level. The vast majority of my cases being on the border involve immigration cases and drug cases, but I have handled everything from RICO to sex trafficking to extortion. Um, and in 2006, I was appointed to handle a capital habeas appeal, and in 2010, I had the unenviable task of watching my client die by lethal injection. That was a pivotal point in my career. It changed me not only personally, but it changed the way that I looked at every court-appointed case that I handled going forward. Um, I, I believe it's a privilege to serve on the panel. However, I do think improvements can be made, and I hope to address some of those with you today. I know that you've received my written testimony, but I do want to highlight a couple of things. <clears throat> there are obviously differences in the way the panel works in El Paso, and in, I practice in Las Cruces, New Mexico. In El Paso, I get on average two to three cases a year. In Las Cruces, I get at least that per month. So my, my practice currently is much more robust in the District of New Mexico, and I will speak uh, primarily to that, except when I'm highlighting um, some differences that I wanted to, the, the committee to be aware of. Um, one of the things that, in speaking with fellow panel attorneys, and you've heard it over the last two days, um, is the problem with vouchers. Vouchers being cut, uh, attorneys not having any recourse to address these reductions, <clears throat> attorneys self-auditing, and just not charging for things that they know the judges either will not pay for or in going back and reviewing vouchers that you know the clerks are going to cut before it ever even gets to the judges. So a lot of that is going on. It's unfortunate um, because, as you know, the hourly rate is already significantly lower than what we would charge in our privately retained cases. And to have a voucher further reduced is very disheartening and discouraging. In some districts, we will receive notification when our vouchers are being cut and given the opportunity to respond to that. In other districts, we don't know until we receive a check in the mail. I have a very capable paralegal who keeps track of all of my billing. We have a, a chart that she has created for the amount that we've billed and then the amount that we're ultimately paid. And that's what I reviewed in preparing my testimony today, that I could say that 60% of my cases this calendar year have received a reduction of some sort. Um, the times that I've been given the opportunity to meet with the judges, I would say about 50% of the time those are still reduced. Recently, I had a situation where a magistrate judge was reviewing a voucher because a visiting judge actually was the one who uh, covered the sentencing hearing. The magistrate judge sent me an email and asked me to explain why I billed a particular amount for meeting with my client's family on so many occasions. I made my case that I thought involving the, the client's family in not only dur during the litigation, but specifically during the sentencing, I thought that was a very important part of my representation to get letters from the family, to get insight from the family. She informed me that that was not compensable under the Criminal Justice Act, and she reduced my voucher accordingly. I accepted that reduction. No questions asked, that's her philosophy. I found out about a week later that she had instructed the clerk's office that when she was the duty, duty judge that I was no longer to get appointments while she was the duty judge. That is the kind of retribution that we face if we speak up about our vouchers being cut. 
that's the kind of things I want this committee to understand. I know you've asked for hard evidence, you've asked that we not give you anecdotes, but that's what we're facing. Those are the kind of choices that attorneys make. Do we, do we raise an issue about our voucher being cut and then face the delays that are inevitably gonna come in getting paid, and then maybe even face what I've faced with this particular judge? So obviously I know that's something y'all are gonna have questions about and I'm happy to, to speak further to my experiences there. Compensation, I touched on a little bit. I think we do have to consider increasing the hourly rate if we're going to attract and keep the highly skilled attorneys that need to do this type of work. I don't know what a perfect hourly billing rate is, but something more than what we're getting now would, would definitely be appreciated, and, and I think it's, it's deserved. The next thing I talked about is resources, and I know the committee's heard a little bit about that. Adequate funding is crucial. There's been some discussion about parity. We all, I think, can agree that there's no way CJA panel lawyers will ever be on par with the U.S. Attorney's Office. We're never going to have those kinds of resources. But sadly, we don't even have the kinds of resources that our public defender's offices have, and I think that needs to be addressed. When an attorney is scared to go in and ask for an investigator for some of the reasons this committee has already heard, um, it puts a chilling effect on our ability to advocate for our clients, and that, that is a concern. Um, in, some, in the Western District of Texas, when I know it's a complex case, I submit a case budget, and I've, I've been very successful in getting my expenses met, my investigators, my experts, and ultimately not having my voucher reduced until it gets to the circuit level, um, and that's a different story. Um, but in the, I think just for the run-of-the-mill cases, as I called them in my, in my written testimony, attorneys are hesitant to go and ask for it because the judges are going to ask why. Why do you need it? This is just, I mean, this is just a re-entry case. Why do you need an investigator? This is just, you know, a possession of marijuana with intent to distribute. Why do you need an investigator? And so they're hesitant because they don't want to be blackballed and they don't want their voucher to be ultimately reduced or some other retribution to come. And then finally, I think training. Training has to be addressed. Um, I know the AO does provide some very good training opportunities, but I think on a local level, and I spoke with one of our district judges. In preparing for this testimony, I spoke with um, two district judges and one magistrate judge to get some insight on, on their, their thoughts. And um, I think we need to do more localized training, specifically when someone's new to a CJA panel. I, I never received any training on how to fill out a voucher. What can we bill for? What can, I mean, I went and took it upon myself to go and look up the CJA Act and, and read Section 230 and find out what all I could do and what I couldn't do and how to do it. But some attorneys don't have time to do that or don't take the time to do that. And I think if we could do more basic training, I know Judge Janelle talked about a criminal law 101. I mean, it, something like that when you've got someone new to the panel, because we want to continue to attract talent. We want to continue to attract skilled attorneys, but we also have to continue training them to keep them up to date with all of the changes that inevitably happen in this area of law. One other thing um, I do want to stress on back on the vouchers is I agree with just about everyone that's testified that I think we do have to take it out of the judge's hands. I don't know what a perfect model is. I, I agree with Stephen McHugh. I think it's it needs to be with someone who does this type of work on a daily basis that understands what a criminal defense lawyer has to do to defend this type of case. And in, in my meeting with one of the federal judges regarding one of my vouchers, he candidly admitted that he had never practiced in, in private practice, he'd never done criminal defense. He had me explain things to him that he really did not understand as far as the, the criminal defense process and had been reducing vouchers because of that lack of understanding. Um, so I think that educating, if it's going to stay with the judges, edu educating the judges as well is going to be helpful, but I am wholeheartedly in favor of being completely removed from that function. And I will yield my time for questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Esper. Good afternoon, committee members. <clears throat> My name is Richard Esper. I practice law in the Western District of Texas, uh, where Judge Cardone sits as one of our five sitting district judges. Uh, I have been in the practice of law, and I think you've read it in my statement. Uh, it's kind of an unusual situation that most people don't find themselves in. Uh, but I uh, practiced uh, for 23 years uh, actively, uh, and then saw the criminal justice system from a very different light. And it opened up my eyes significantly to what I thought was most important about the practice of law. Uh, after an obstacle-filled uh, recovery period, uh, I have uh, been practicing since 2009. I immediately got myself qualified very quickly onto the CJA panel and, to, and qualified uh, to handle mega-complex 
uh, cases. Uh, I think that the thing that is important to me, uh, and I want to stress, is that handling cases on the border, I think, is different than anywhere else in the country uh, because there is so, so much diversity in the cases that you have and in the clientele that you have. Uh, number one, uh, we have a multitude. I think we have probably, and Judge Cardone could tell you, if not the biggest docket in the country, one of the biggest dockets. Uh, the majority of cases are either illegal entry or re-entry cases that involve uh, non-English speaking defendants. And number two, we have a multitude, and probably way too many, drug cases. Now, the drug cases range from immig fixed immigration checkpoint cases uh, to what we call bridge cases. Those are relatively simple. They're not unnecessarily complex. But we also have a multitude of what I call mega complex criminal cases where you've had historical investigations that are going on by the United States Attorney's Office. Uh, many times they result in multiple defendants, multiple counts, Title III wire interceptions, multiple cooperators. And those are the cases to me that are the most challenging. Uh, and I know multiple defendant cases exist in every jurisdiction, but it seems like in the Western District of Texas, we get a lot of them simply because of the investigative resources that are put on, uh, the, are put into the United States Attorney's Office in trying to stem the flow uh, of drug trafficking into the United States. And of course, El Paso is one of the major uh, entry points uh, for drugs into the United States. But handling one of those cases, a mega complex criminal case, is very, very challenging. Uh, and I think that's where the problem with resources comes into play, especially when you're talking about parity uh, with the United States Attorney's Office. Because what inevitably is happening in these cases is that there is a viewpoint from the judiciary that, okay, if, if I've got all these lawyers appointed, uh, I'm going to get a big CJA bill, bill from every single lawyer. So one of the judges proposed to the U.S. Attorney's Office, just give each lawyer uh, uh, their discovery as to their particular client. And uh, I, uh, I guess maybe fearlessly spoke up and said, no, that, that won't work. Because uh, as, I, as I've had many times happen to me or clients happen to me, uh, you get stung in trial by the so-called exception, the co-conspirator exception to the hearsay rule, where your client all of a sudden is talked about by other co-defendants. And so if, if you're trying to limit your discovery, to, to limit the CJA bill, that limits your effectiveness as a lawyer. And one of the things that really drew my attention uh, during my, uh, in between phase one and phase two of my legal career was just how much in the dark uh, a lot of defendants are, uh, simply because uh, a lot of lawyers are not properly trained. Uh, a lot of lawyers don't take the time uh, to explain to clients uh, what is going on, and especially the non-English speakers. Now, I'm aware that with respect to funding, uh, for example, uh, I think one of the lawyers earlier this morning talked about non non necessary expenses. There's a you can you don't even have to ask the court for it. You're, you're allowed up to eight hundred dollars for non non necessity uh, services. And uh, I, not because of fear, uh, but I always take an interpreter with me whenever I meet with a client. Not because uh, I don't speak Spanish, because I do. In fact, one of the forms, in, in, whenever you're qualifying, you have to state whether you're a Spanish speaker or not, or whether you have, you have the services available uh, for translation purposes. Uh, so I don't ever bill for that interpreter, not out of fear of, of a voucher getting cut, but I do have a concern that I'm raising a conflict about whether or not I should even be representing Spanish speakers. Now, here's what the problem that I saw 15 years ago was that lawyers, there are Spanish speakers and then there are real Spanish speakers. Uh, I'm, I'm a Spanish speaker. I'm not a real Spanish speaker. But, uh, I would gratuitously give myself a C plus, which means that I can converse in Spanish with a non-English speaker. I can, I can carry on a conversation. I can understand things. They understand me. But when you start talking about uh, 
explaining to them what are their available paths, what are the particular nuances of evidence that exist against them, explaining to them these federal sentencing guidelines. Of course, they were mandatory at a time. Now they're advisory, which means you've got to explain even more what that means, explaining adjustments, explaining offender characteristics, explaining the 3553A factors and variant sentences and grounds for it. You, I believe you really have to have someone that is a real Spanish speaker with you so that they understand what's going to happen to them or what likely will happen to them in the path that they choose and what will likely happen to them when it comes to sentencing so that when it's all over with, they may not agree with the sentence, they may not like it, but at least they know and they understand what is going to happen to them. The same thing applies in these some of these mega complex criminal cases where you're trying to explain Title III wire interceptions to them. Uh, you need the services of an interpreter. And uh, I feel, and, and I, I take my own interpreter, but again, that's, a, that's an expenditure that I think can be covered under the Criminal Justice Act. Technically, you can bill for up to $800 and not have it cut. But I know a lot of lawyers are afraid to ask for that because you're going to get a voucher cut, number one. And number two, you're going to be questioned about, wait a minute, you're a Spanish speaker. What's the problem here? Why do you need an interpreter? And uh, I think that that's an issue that is particular to border cases that a lot of judges in the different parts of the country, with all due respect, are not probably <clears throat> honed in on. Uh, and so consequently, I think that uh, that needs to be provided so that effective representation can apply. Number two, we do a lot of traveling, and I know uh, Ms. Uh, Duncan in the earlier panel talked about uh, access to clients. Uh, you know, the closest facility that we have is a 40 or 50 minute drive each way just to see a client. Uh, more and more they're placing clients in Sierra Blanca, Texas, which is 90 miles away. And consequently, uh, as she had indicated, Ms. Duncan indicated, uh, a big complaint is clients don't have access to their lawyers or they show up the day before. The bigger problem is the location of where these pretrial detainees are kept. Now, I know that the courts don't have any control over that. I know that's a problem that I know every judge hears from every lawyer. Uh, but I think the, the possible solution to it is, number one, there needs to be more adequate funding uh, I do believe that a pay that an increase is appropriate. I know in the state court system in El Paso County, they just raised their hourly rate by fifteen dollars an hour. Now, their hourly rate is much lower than the than the CJA rate, but uh, I think there should be a rate up to one hundred and forty four, as as advocated uh, or as stated earlier. But I think in mega complex cases, the rate should be one hundred and sixty five dollars an hour, because there you're fighting the entire United States of America. The, the, the prosecution and they've been investigating these cases for years and you're supposed to get prepared and ready within a very short period of time and be able to provide effective representation and I think it takes uh, a lot of skill a lot of hard work uh, and so therefore I think in order to stay competitive uh, I think the rate needs to uh, increase when Miss Harbor talked about a death penalty case I, I don't think there we've ever had any training uh, to take a state habeas death penalty case. I know Judge Cardone appointed me to one recently uh, that came through the state system, and when I got it, I thought I was going to pass out because I, I'd never handled one. And so what I did is I reached out to some colleagues in Austin who had done death penalty cases and got some guidance from them and uh, tried to figure out how I should navigate representing someone uh, whose uh, the death penalty has been imposed, and now we're weaving our way through the federal court. And uh, I think perhaps, well, I don't think we have anybody in El Paso that has had adequate training to handle uh, state habeas death penalty cases. But that's another area that I wanted, that I wanted to, that I think needs to be addressed uh, uh, by the committee members. Uh, finally, I believe that because border cases are unique, and because, and because of the, the, the volume of mega complex drug cases uh, that exist in the Western District of Texas, in particular El Paso, uh, I think there needs to be more funding, higher, a higher pay rate, so that we can stay competitive. I do believe that the panel lawyers in El Paso, uh, I believe that there are a handful that are hands down probably the best lawyers in El Paso. 
uh, as, as criminal defense lawyers, uh, and and are and are much better than anything the public defender's has, office has to offer. But there's also a number of lawyers that aren't in that league either, and that's where I think those young lawyers need some training, need to attend programs, programs and training that occur locally, because if you got to go to a, a training program that's two thousand miles away. You're not getting a paycheck while you leave. You're not getting a paycheck while you're gone for a week or two weeks. Uh, but I think training that is in a local level uh, would benefit uh, the younger panel members. I know in our division we have a mentor-mentee program. Uh, and I know every mentee I've had uh, really enjoyed the entire process. And, and I've invited them to uh, make sure that they check with me and know my schedule every month so they can follow me around like a little puppy dog. Maybe they learn something. Maybe learn, they learn how not to do something. Uh, but adequate training is a necessity uh, for especially the younger panel members so that we can keep pace with not only the public defender's office, but hopefully keep pace with our adversaries in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Thank you. Mr. Sapia. Thank you, Judge. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak today and answer questions on the very important topics that you've been tasked to consider and report on to the United States Supreme Court. My name is Philip Sapien, and uh, next October I will celebrate practicing law 25 years. I was uh, raised in a small town just south of Santa Fe, the town of Bernalillo, uh, New Mexico, uh, on the way to Albuquerque. Uh, my uh, family history uh, involves uh, ancestors seven or eight generations back, Spanish ancestors uh, that uh, my mother can trace back to prior to 1848 before this part of the world became part of the great United States of America. But my paternal grandparents were from Mexico and they came here less than a hundred years ago fleeing the Mexican Revolution. But I think that's some of the drop back that some of us that practice here in this district have when we relate to cases that occur here on the border that, that have been mentioned uh, in terms of the, the family dynamics, the family impacts, uh, the separation of families uh, that occur, and, uh, and, and really the difficultness of those cases. Certainly we have laws in this country, immigration laws that need to be uh, respected, but uh, those cases are not any more simple, I think, or easier to, uh, to conduct than, uh, than say drug or, um, or other uh, case in the federal system. Uh, I um, am a former uh, board member of the New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers. I'm also former president of the New Mexico Hispanic Bar Association uh, here in uh, New Mexico. I uh, think I started my career with the naive belief that I could uh, help people in need and still make a uh, lucrative uh, income. And uh, although I do enjoy comfortable living uh, in private practice and as part of the CJA panel, uh, I think I've come to learn that really the people most need of our help uh, in this country are the indigent and that those are really the most vulnerable in our criminal justice system. I spent uh, five years at the New Mexico Public Defender's Office where I gained valuable trial experience from some of the best lawyers money can't buy. Uh, and after a uh, trial where my client earned an acquittal, a, a state district judge who I respected very much, he'd been a state public defender, he'd been a federal public defender, uh, he said, you know, you really need to get into federal court. I think it would make you a better attorney. And so about 15 years ago, I did apply for the CJA panel. I was fortunate enough to be selected and have been reappointed multiple times. But I certainly believe that that experience has enhanced my ability and skill uh, as an attorney, and I do uh, value uh, th those experiences and, uh, and what that uh, has taught me. I will tell you that other than raising children, running a private practice uh, and a small business uh, has been the hardest thing that uh, I have undertaken on a uh, professional level. I spent 10 years as a solo practitioner and then uh, almost 10 years ago, one of my brothers uh, left, the, uh, he, was, he was the second in our family to become a, an attorney, my younger brother. He left the uh, defense practice and we formed a, uh, a partnership that engages in civil and criminal uh, litigation. Over the past uh, seven, eight, nine years, 
we survived through some very tough economic times, uh, as, uh, as the committee knows uh, we all experienced. The, the CJ appointments that I received during that period were really a valuable component to us surviving as a business, uh, to help pay overhead, to help keep our staff who also have families uh, employed, and uh, certainly was an important part of uh, maintaining uh, our doors open. During my career as a CJA panel attorney, I have handled Indian country cases, bank robberies, single defendant drug cases, and many complex multi-defendant uh, cases, and I generally average probably about eight to 10 appointments a year. Some of the things I would like the committee to consider, I don't think are, are any novel ideas. I think it's been a theme that has kind of developed over the past couple of days. One of the things I want to emphasize is that I think locally we have a very good working relationship with the district defender. Um, Mr. McHugh has done an outstanding job, I believe, in providing communication uh, to the panel, uh, updates on, on cases, uh, various panel issues, our application deadlines, um, notifying us of, of various CLEs that are offered either through the New, New Mexico criminal defense lawyers, the winning strategies, CLEs, and things of that nature. And I always know that I can contact one of my colleagues in the Federal Defender's Office should I have a, a question on a case issue, some perplexing legal issue, a, a sample motion, anything that, uh, that we may need. I think the, the, the various public, federal public defenders are available and are willing to help. Certainly, I think there always is room for improvement. And so the second point I would make is I think, as, as has been stated already now and, and earlier uh, in this public hearing, is that we do need to expand the training opportunities. I think when I first joined the panel, it was really trial by fire. And uh, you just got in there and basically handled the cases and, and uh, kind of uh, sank or swim as the case um, may be, but I do think we need to expand the uh, the local training opportunities. I think it's often difficult for solo or small firm attorneys who are on the panel to attend some of the out-of-state CLEs. It, it may not just be a cost issue, it may be their schedule. Uh, I Speaking for myself, because we maintain a civil and a, and a state court practice as well, sometimes the schedule just will not allow attendance of of a, a CLE that, that uh, may be something that, that we're really interested in. So I think if we can expand those opportunities on a local level, that would be important. Uh, a suggestion might be to have perhaps maybe monthly brown bag CLE sessions that the district defender helps to put on with the panel, the panel rep. Uh, and uh, you know there may be some pushback from panel members, but to maybe make at least two or three of those mandatory throughout the year. Uh, so that we stay abreast of, of changes in the law or, or trends in, in sentencing, use of experts, uh, things of that nature. It's been discussed whether or not, uh, for example, having an outside person review vouchers could be done without compensation. And unfortunately, I think the answer is no, and I think the same would be for trying to expand these training opportunities. I think something would need to be sought out in terms of either enhancing the defenders, the district defenders uh, budget, or perhaps providing some compensation for the panel rep to help organize these CLEs uh, on a regular basis. I know that it's often difficult to get a group of, of attorneys with various busy schedules together, but I think if something could be scheduled on a regular basis, that would, would certainly uh, help enhance our uh, training opportunities. I think the last uh, point I would uh, would make is is a, a theme that's already been emphasized about judicial uh, independence with respect to the um, the panel. I think that the selection and appointment of attorneys, as well as the approval of vouchers, is something that needs to be considered uh, on an outside basis from uh, the judiciary. Certainly, the courts have a vested interest in ensuring that competent, if not zealous, legal representation is provided for defendants. But I think from a public policy standpoint, public confidence requires that there's a certain amount of independence 
from the courts and the, the United States Attorney's Office and the defense bar uh, to ensure confidence in our in our system. I think that is is one thing that that our own our profession has always struggled with in terms of, of public confidence. And I know when I was a state public defender, and even at times uh, as a CJA lawyer, a criminal defendant will basically believe that because I am being paid by the government, I am essentially working for the government. And I think that's always a, um, a dynamic that we have to kind of overcome in representation of our of our clients. Uh, one thing I know that um, Damon Martinez, the, the New Mexico U.S. Attorney mentioned yesterday, and, and I'll preface by saying I've known Mr. Martinez over 30 years uh, when we were young college students, but I would respectfully disagree with his suggestion that the U.S. Attorney's Office should be involved in vetting of defense counsel for the, the CJA uh, panel. Um, and it's really for the same reasons uh, as having independence from the judiciary. I don't know that I can provide you what the right balance uh, would be. Um, I think that uh, certainly I'm hopeful that this committee at the conclusion of the various public hearings will be able to uh, ascertain proposals or some type of plan that will sustain the CJA program. Certainly, I think the viability and relevance of this program is more important uh, now than ever to help maintain the public confidence in our legal system. And I think one of the things I would ask the committee to, to take away to future public hearings is the belief, the ideal, the concept that really those of us on the panel uh, don't do this for the money or because it's the popular thing uh, to do. Certainly, I think those of us that have been in private practice and certainly on the civil side will tell you that we can make much more money with somewhat less stress uh, and anxiety, I think, in other uh, areas of law. I often have to uh, engage friends and family in conversation as to why do you do this? How can you represent a criminal defendant? And certainly, um, just outside this um, committee room on one of the office walls, you may see my last name. Uh, out there, and that's because my youngest brother is uh, a state senator uh, here in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, certainly, I entertained ideas of politics as a young lawyer, but as a private practitioner and a CJ lawyer, there's just no way I could leave the practice long enough to be able to engage in that kind of endeavor. And I think also being a criminal defense lawyer, because it's not the popular thing to do, is obviously something that's hard to overcome in the, in the political realm. But what I would leave you with is that you leave with the understanding and the belief that we do this because we're committed to the indigent representation of, uh, or the representation of indigent clients and to making sure that the Constitution and the Sixth Amendment mean what these documents say they, they mean and what they stand for. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Thank you. <clears throat> On Monday before I left, the federal defender in my district emailed me, and she said two things. Good luck, and I thought to myself, oh, geez, does she know something that I don't know? <laughs> and then she said, two of the new defenders are going to be down in Santa Fe while you're there, and let me know that they would be staying in a nearby hotel. And I thought about that for a minute, because these two new defenders were not baby lawyers. One of the lawyers has as much experience as I do. She has almost 23 years in practice as a very seasoned criminal appellate lawyer. And the other person has been in practice for about 15 years um, in doing all retained and CJA criminal work. The idea that our federal defender thought that before these two lawyers actually joined forces with her team, that they needed additional training, that they have a certain basic foundation before they came on board, I think is really what I want to stress with this panel. In our district, um, we have a model plan and this is the standard that our attorneys are supposed to practice to, our CJA attorneys. They are supposed to provide services that will commensurate with those rendered if counsel were privately retained. Imagine what that means if you are somebody who's got an intellectual property um, issue. Are you going to go to a real estate lawyer and ask them to help you out? 
Imagine if you are somebody with a health care problem, or are you going to go to somebody that specializes in wills and trusts? I mean, that answer should be obvious to everyone that's sitting here. And yet, the level of care and expertise and experience that we expect of our CJA lawyers does not necessarily rival um, what we would hold for other people in private practice. So in our district, I just want to share with you briefly um, what this means to us, how it is achieved, and how we are working on maintaining it. Um, and I will note right here that I practice in two different districts. I, I practice in Kansas City. Um, my office, um, because it's on the state line, I practice in the District of Kansas as well as the Western District of Missouri. They function very differently. I'm the panel rep in the District of Kansas. But I want to talk to you about what we do in the District of Kansas because some of the things that we do I think are really, really good. And in a day of hearings where we hear a lot of bad, where we hear we need to do this, we need to do this, I would like to give you all some ideas of what things actually are working. So one of the big uh, things that I have noticed is that there is truly a disparity between Defender um, and CJA. And that disparity comes in training, it comes in terms of organizational structure, um, obviously, it's run like a, like a large law firm as opposed to a hundred mini law firms that are out there. Um, there are differences between defenders and the CJA in terms of funding. Um, you don't have to explain to a judge why you need services. You don't have to talk, as I did just last week, to a, a clerk um, who asked me to explain on a case that was three years old what the copies were that I had made um, in that case. Um, there are enough differences that when, I think it was um, uh, you, Mr. Khan, that had indicated that um, our CJA counsel and, and uh, AFPDs is one higher than another, that I think that given some of the resources that are allocated to AFPDs, that you can say in many circumstances, yes, that office enjoys a very high caliber of lawyer that practices there. But the positives that have occurred in our district since we revamped it about 18 months ago, where we created a structured system where lawyers now actually have to apply to be on the CJA panel, where we have contained the size of the panel so that attorneys know that they are going to get enough cases that they can remain proficient um, in the panel, where we have set up a lot of of training for those lawyers and required them to go through that training, we are seeing an increase in performance and practice among our attorneys and I think a level of content about the kind of work that they do. I think this is important because if we want to recruit new lawyers, young lawyers to come into what is a very difficult, very stressful, very high level of practice we have to give them the tools and the mechanisms to make them feel good about the environment in which they are practicing. So in our district, we do e-vouchering like a lot of other districts do, but we also do interim vouchers so that lawyers don't have to wait two or three years to get paid or to find out that their voucher is going to be to be slashed you know, down to a, a third of maybe what they would have submitted. We have a buffer in terms of a CJA administrator. Our, our CJA administrator is the one who appoints um, attorneys to the cases on a rotational basis. So it is not based on a magistrate who makes that particular decision. That CJA is also, administrator is also the one who reviews our vouchers preliminarily. As a former criminal defense lawyer that is highly respected among the bar and the judiciary, she has the ability to red flag things that she knows might cause the judge some question or concern and talk to the lawyer about that. She she also then is a conduit with the court when the court says, why would this attorney think it was necessary to spend all of this time? And she can, she can get that information. So we are seeing our vouchers uh, enjoy a higher level of approval in many circumstances because um, we have this buffer system. We have also enjoyed 
the benevolence of our court. And I think this is very, very significant. Um, we have a very strong bench bar committee um, that is led by one of our one of our judges, and it provides the financial support to um, fund a lot of this training. We have six hours of mandatory federal criminal defense training. Um, this past year, the Federal Defender's Office provided 28 hours for free and provided a meal in conjunction with that. So, for example, um, when we had the Johnson case that came down and uh, rendered the uh, residual clause of the ACCA void for vagueness, there were many lawyers that wondered, okay, so how, how, what are the practical effects of this? The Public Defender's Office put on one of the meatiest, most substantive trainings about the impact of that particular case. These are things that the Federal Defender can do because she has the connections, she has the resources, and she is willing to devote them. So in sum, I would say having a benevolent um, and supportive judiciary has been important to our success. In the converse, you would see why that that could be very influential and why you would not have a successful panel. We have a federal defender who believes in the CJA and believes in a strong alliance and yet does not want to dominate the CJA panel. Um, and that we have also um, I like to think of myself as an engaged panel rep um, so that we can work on more collaborative, um, such as that we do a, a Fed talk, which is just a take on a TED talk, where I will host a group of lawyers at my office. It won't be for CLE. It'll be for um, a light lunch or late afternoon snacks. And we'll talk about something that's new that's going on in the district. It's an opportunity for people to engage in, with one another. So those are my, my comments, and I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have, either about the District of Kansas or the Western District of Missouri. All right, we'll begin with Mr. Kahn. So I actually would like to start with a question directed to those of you who practice on the border. You know, I, I hear often, as somebody from San Diego, I hear people talk about handling simple immigration cases, and I either cringe or laugh, depending upon my mood at the moment. Um, and, but I'd like to ask you some specific questions about resources. You know, does the system allow you, and I'd like a comment from each of you, in, in, you know, in your run-of-the-mill 1326 case, to engage in, a, in an adequate investigation on derivative citizenship? Will that be funded? Well, let's start with you, Mr. Ashton. I, I have never uh, had a 1326 case where that issue arose, uh, whether or not derivative citizenship was an issue in the case. I know I appear at docket calls in all five uh, courts, and those issues are raised frequently. But I see that they're being raised by uh, <coughs> by the federal public defender's offices because they somehow end up with those cases where that have derivative citizenship claims. And uh, I believe they have the they do have the resources to adequately investigate der derivative citizenship claims. Uh, I've never I've never handled one to where uh, the issue presented itself to where I had to make a claim for, for investigative expenses. How about you? I've had one. Uh, recently and went to the judge about it and it was suggested that the client's family hire an immigration attorney to look into it. Um, in lengthy discussions with that client's family, uh, they decided, well, and the client decided he did not want to sit in jail and wait for that process, that he would simply be deported uh, back to Mexico and would fight it at that point. I explained the ramifications of having that felony conviction and, and all of that, and they, they chose not to. But I've never, um, that was the only time I've had that arise. I have one currently in a separate case. It's a, it's a drug case, but I believe my client has a claim to derivative citizenship. Obviously, it's not a defense to the charge, and her client, ha uh, that client's family has hired an immigration attorney to work with me to try to get it done expeditiously. Of course, that's out of our hands. But that was my, my one experience, that it was suggested that the client's family should investigate that and pay for it. I've, I think I've had it rise once, I can recall specifically, perhaps twice. But I, they were at a time, I think, when this district was being overwhelmed with border cases. 
And um, as I recall, it was really incumbent on me to attempt to investigate that as best as I could on my own through the family uh, and uh, somewhat discouraged from, well, you know, this is an immigration case. I'm, you don't need an investigator uh, for that. You know, you can interview the family yourself or, or have them try and attempt to find documents and, and things like that. But again, it was at a time I know the district was, was being overrun really with, with uh, immigration cases. I mean, there was a time when we were receiving, Las Cruces was getting the bulk of the cases and they were transferring hundreds literally to Albuquerque to be handled up here just to, um, to kind of relieve the, uh, the pressure. And so I think there was a tremendous amount of pressure on the system to resolve those cases as, as quickly as possible. And, and that any issues like that, you needed to basically try and investigate that on your own without expending a, you know, a large amount of resources. And I'd have the same question about motions under 1326 given room to investigate, to engage in legal research, briefing of those motions, you're shaking your head just. No. I am not either. No. no. But simply not. And do, is it your sense that the Federal Defender Office does have the resources? Absolutely, they do. And that's another disparity that, that exists between panel attorneys and the public defender's offices. They have resources available. Whereas if we want to seek those resources, except for that little cap for non-necessary <laughs> services, which I think all services are necessary, but uh, but we don't have to ask for anything that's, more, more, that's less than $800. Uh, uh, you know, we have to go and ask the judge. And I'll tell you, we in, in our division, we have a uh, borrowing uh, counsel's Term. We have a very benevolent uh, court. All our judges are very, very gracious. They're very uh, accommodating to us as lawyers because they, they not only do they have challenges in, in handling the cases and in managing their docket, uh, but they realize the, the difficulties that we have uh, as panel attorneys in representing people. So th for the most part, uh, by and large, the, the, the judges in our division are, are very gracious and very benevolent as far as if you go to them and ask them and explain to them why you need certain services. Uh, I've never had one that has been turned down. If, if so long as I've got it, I put it in writing and why I want it, uh, I've never had one denied. Let me ask you, you already touched on the question with regard to interpreters. Also, let me start by saying in my office, we have a large staff of all certified, federally certified interpreters. And they're used not only by our non-Spanish speaking attorneys, but by our native Spanish speakers as well, because no one should be explaining complex legal terms without the assistance of somebody who's a professional interpreter. I, I, I gather your experience is you're not going to have those resources. Is that accurate for also Ms. Harbor Valley? No, that is, it's the complete opposite in the District of New Mexico. There's a list of contract interpreters. And whenever you are assigned a non-English speaking client, there's, it's just, it's going to happen. There's an interpreter that comes with it, basically. Okay. I, I work with one or two on a regular basis. And when I get a case in El Paso with a uh, non-English speaker, I pay them out of my own pocket to come with me and, and handle the El Paso case. Because in El Paso, you're not going to get an interpreter. And are you also able to get those interpreters for you in a case where there are Spanish language transcripts and that sort of thing? Yes. To get that work done? Yes. He does all of that for me. And in El Paso, no. No. I pay for it out of my own pocket. I, I have a case right now. It's really, comp uh, really, really varied. Uh, one of my, my clients is actually from Romania, uh, in Judge Cardone's court, and uh, we're trying to find Romanian translators. Well, in El Paso, that is a real challenge. I can imagine. Uh, and I've got another client who is a... U.S. citizen, but she's Vietnamese, and she got arrested at the checkpoint, at the Sierra Blanca checkpoint. And uh, I have had to get creative uh, to get to get the interpreter services. Uh, sometimes I have to reach out. Fortunately, with the Vietnamese client, she has a cousin who's a second-year law student at UCLA. So I've been able to use her as an interpreter uh, so that my client understands uh, the complexities of the case and defenses that are available to her. So sometimes you just have to get creative. Uh, it, it, uh, you, you'd like to bill for those things, but uh, in, in those cases, uh, 
you know, they're not they're not charging me anything. But uh, sometimes you you really need, and, and I think interpreters are also important because they serve as a witness to a lot of what is going on between you and the client, so that later on a client can't make a, a claim of ineffective assistance of counsel because you didn't explain things to them. We, we all know about it. the 2255 petitions that frequently pop up. Uh, many of them are frivolous. Some of them have some merit, but if you have an interpreter that's interpreting complex issues, that's going to eliminate those claims, I think. Can I ask a follow-up question, Mr. Tom? Just real quick. It, it, about, I, I am at a loss to understand how you get a interpreter with a case in a federal court. Um, I, I don't know of, I mean, maybe other courts in the country do this, um, but, you know, there's a budget for our interpreters. Um, we have interpreters in our court, but to supply a court to a, uh, an interpreter to a criminal defendant, um, it, it's paid through the court. You don't, it's not no, through CJA attorney. He files a, he files a CJA 21. And I sign off on it. Now through the e-voucher system, I basically submit it for him and my electronic signature serves as my certification that what he did on the case was supervised by me and I approve his amount. And so it is so it, go ahead. It is done completely. It's through a CJA 21 that mm -hmm. is then funded. Correct. And I don't have to ask for it. It's just, there. like I said, there's a list of contract interpreters that have been approved, approved by the district. I work with one particular one. When he's not available, I have a backup. Uh, and, and that's that's how they do it in the District of New Mexico. And it doesn't matter if if you're a, a Spanish speaker or, or not, um, they just assume that you're going to use an interpreter to explain those complex legal terms to have that person there because it's necessary. Judge, if I may address, I think my experience has been a little bit different, maybe because of Las Cruces to Albuquerque. I mean, we don't get an interpreter with each case. There's the court interpreters that are obviously there for court hearings and things like that. But uh, one one experience I've run into before is in terms of I'm comfortable communicating in Spanish verbally, but in terms of translating uh, and needing assistance, we would often use the court employee interpreters, but there were times where they were really overwhelmed and busy themselves, and they said, you know, I just don't have time, you have to find somebody, and the problem, at least in Albuquerque, was finding a contract interpreter that was willing to do it for the, the rate of of pay that uh, that is offered to the the CJA program. So, Ms. Har uh, Harbor Valdez, why don't you ask for CJA twenty one in uh, the in El Paso? I mean, you, you do cases there. Um, why have you never asked for one? I was instructed when I first went on the panel that um, we have to check the box whether you're a Spanish speaker or or not. And if you are not a Spanish speaker, it is your responsibility to provide your own interpreter. That it's not something the court will provide. I was and, I, and you were instructed. Well. I was told that when I went on the panel. Okay. And, and I'm so I've never asked. And, and maybe that's my fault. But that's it was kind of made known that that it was not going to be provided for. If you were on the panel, you needed to either speak Spanish or provide those services yourself. And do you know who instructed you, sir? Someone in the clerk's office told me that. Judge, but, you know, one thing I also think is that even as a, as a Spanish speaker, I think sometimes, and this may be more perception than reality, is that the, the idea is, you know, well, why do you need an interpreter if you're a Spanish speaker? But, you know, if you're representing a Cuban defendant, say, in a drug case, I mean, you know, it, uh, that Spanish is faster, spoken much faster, sometimes difficult to understand. And so there are times when I would want an interpreter to assist me just to make sure there aren't any communication issues, uh, you know, or something gets gets missed in terms of translation of a plea agreement or something like that. But I think that it's somewhat also that the court kind of looks at it like, well, you know, I, I don't, why is this necessary if you're a Spanish speaker? It's been 17 years in South Florida. I'll, I'll vouch for Mr. <laughs> 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 there are two different languages. Absolutely. We've been hearing and reading, and I think we'll continue to be hearing and reading about the suggestion that the CJA or various aspects of it be taken out of the judiciary or out of the hands of judges. Um, can anyone think of any aspect of it that should remain with the judiciary? Uh, and if the answer is no, we can't think of, of anything. What's your second choice if we can't, if, if we decide it should be taken out of the judiciary, but we don't think that's practical, what would be our second line of recommendations that you think we should be making? 
Mr. Ezra. Uh, I think that uh, obviously I, I feel that the CJA should be uh, independent, but I do feel that there needs to be some judicial gatekeeping that needs to stay in place. Uh, and uh, I, I know this might be anecdotal, but uh, I was involved in a public corruption case where there was bribery allegations. And one of the other CJA lawyers in the case uh, asked me whether or not, uh, or suggested to me, that uh, that lawyer was going to read Citizens United and bill for legal research. And I told him, that's absurd. You can't be billing to read a 97-page opinion that has nothing to do with this case uh, and then bill for it. So from the standpoint that I think the judiciary can at least keep the, the voucher gouging at a minimum, I think is important. But, and, and, I, and maybe there needs to be some sort of uh, advisory role, I'm not sure, but I, I do feel that the criminal justice uh, attorneys need to be independent uh, of the judiciary, but I do feel the judiciary needs to stay uh, kind of as, as, as the watch, kind of as the, as, uh, Mr. Morris said, you know, that the fox has to be watching the chicken uh, house uh, because there are people that are abusing the system that are, that are on the CJA panel. Uh, and I think it's sad, but there needs to be some gatekeeping done. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly the mechanics of how it would work, but I think the judiciary would be the ones to manage that system so that you don't have billing to read Citizens United in a case as legal research uh, when it has nothing to do with your case. But not, not, not to interrupt, but I mean, what makes the judiciary so uniquely possessed of ability to be able to do that any better than anybody else could? And particularly in the case and the example you're using, I would assume that that lawyer would submit an invoice that said legal research, not I read a case that has nothing to do with this case. Right. It, it would be legal <laughs> research and then yeah. there'd be a, a, a 5.7 hours. Right. And, uh, uh, I mean, if, they were, if the person was fool enough, foolish enough to say, I read Citizens United, a 97-page opinion, uh, that voucher, that, I think that's going to get cut because yeah. it has nothing to do with the case. So I think the judiciary would know that. Uh, whereas an experienced lawyer know that? Also? Absolutely. An experienced lawyer would know that as well. I mean, I, I picked up on it right away. I said, you're out of your mind uh, to do something like that. So granted, uh, maybe the, a buffer... Uh, like they have in the District of Kansas uh, or Western District of Missouri, uh, could serve as an independent auditor, if you will, uh, on vouchers. I would like to see it completely out of the hands of the judges. I, I disagree with um, with Mr. Esper. I don't think that voucher gouging is as big of a problem as maybe you've seen. I, I haven't seen that. And maybe that's because the, the practice we have in the District of New Mexico is, I mean, there is a very... There is a panel appointed, I happen to just have been recently appointed, that screens and selects the attorneys that will be on one of four panels in the district. The uh, Chief Judge Armijo sets on that panel, Mr. McHugh sets on that panel, uh, one of the magistrate judge sets on that panel. And I, so I think there's already a screening in place to get good people on the panel. I would like to see that continue over to someone, to a panel or even the public defender that reviews the vouchers, someone that knows the practice, that knows what we're doing, that has somewhat of an independence from, from the case. Well, is there a value to having uh, Chief Judge Armijo and the magistrate judge yes. on the panel? Because there is a value to having their input because they see these attorneys before them. So you wouldn't want that taken totally out? No, I, I like having their input. I think it's important because what we see our colleagues do in court is obviously viewed differently than maybe what the judges see. And also the judges are the ones seeing at that time the vouchers and they know if there's gouging going on. And there's a mechanism to correct that the way the panel's set up in New Mexico. We also hear complaints, um, disciplinary complaints and other complaints and, and make recommendations to the judges for disciplinary issues. But I would like to see the vouchers completely taking out, taken out of the judges' hands. So you would see selection and removal having judges have input in that. Is that I think that's important because those are the lawyers that are practicing before them. Ms. Morgan. 
Um, I would have to agree with what um, Ms. Harbor Valdez said um, in many respects. One of the things that I think is um, very problematic is the judicial review of the vouchers. And let me just give you an example. In the Western District of um, Missouri, as the court, or as all of you know, that case budgeting is becoming more and more prevalent, and um, there is a, a fair amount of time that you take to actually budget out your case. It actually requires you to organize your case and think strategically through, at least at that phase of the process, what you are envisioning that you will do. And it takes quite a bit of time to do that. Um, we have a judge in the Western District of Missouri who has been very vocal about the fact that it doesn't matter that budgeting is provided for within the CJA and that you're supposed to be able to bill for it. He has absolutely said he will not pay for that, and he has made it very clear when an attorney challenged him on this that... Um, that that attorney should think about whether he challenged him or perhaps he didn't want to be on the panel any further. This is the kind of thing I'm, that I'm concerned about is because we don't have a real review process. So maybe we have a, a grumpy magistrate on a particular day or for a particular type of work that's being performed. Um, but the review process that we have when an attorney challenges it, not only do you have maybe the kickback in terms of consequence to the lawyer, but it's not a significant, in my opinion, appeal process because where does it go? You tell the you you say something to the to the judge and you explain why you did it, and the judge goes, Meh, all right. Um, so to me, the way that it is set up right now, because there is no valid mechanism for review, or what I consider valid mechanism for review, I think is very problematic. I also think that what we have done in our district, um, have, and I say our district, in the District of Kansas, having um, certain members of the court involved in the selection process, I think has been beneficial. It has been helpful. It also has allowed them when they have some perhaps criticism of a particular attorney for us to um, talk with that particular attorney and find out, is there something going on? Is there an issue? Discreetly, of course, um, but to enable that person to be aware that, um, you know, maybe that there is, maybe that there's a problem or that there's resources available because I just didn't know there were resources available. Um, so I do think that there has been a benefit in having the court on that initial selection process but the buffer that we have in place with our CJ administrator, which is not in every district, um, has been that she is the one who handles the appointments. And that has been great because there are some, before we did this, there were some attorneys that got um, you know, 18 or 19 or 20 appointments per year, and there were other attorneys who got one or two. And you cannot be proficient in federal practice if you do one or two cases every year. So taking that away and kind of removing that potential for favoritism, I think has been has been significant. Morgan, who's, who's paying your, your CJA administrator? Um, it comes out of, I believe, the federal defender budget. Well, as I mentioned, um, you know, I, I certainly think the court has a vested interest in competent representation on the panel. I think the perception from some of the CJA attorneys I've talked with is a concern that the, the judiciary has uh, undue influence, I think, on who gets to sit on the selection committee, so to speak, and so that uh, does the court really have one vote or does it have multiple votes because of, of who's been appointed to this, um, to the committee that considers uh, the uh, applications. Now, you know, I've never sat on, on the committee. I know attorneys that have. They've always taken the responsible, responsibility very seriously, and so there's never been any disclosure of specific discussions, but I think there is a feeling that, uh, at least among the CJA lawyers I've talked to, that it would be better to uh, remove that influence, if you will, in terms of the selection and appointment of attorneys. I do know of situations where there are Article Three judges in this district who will seek out certain uh, attorneys to handle uh, cases, which I think, uh, well, you know, I, I, I wouldn't question necessarily the experience of those attorneys that are being sought out. I think that that also creates a, a perception of favoritism, perhaps in in, uh, in certain appointments that, that take place. 
uh, in terms of the voucher, um, uh, the voucher uh, approval, you know, I do think it, it is difficult. I guess I'm torn on that because I think that the judge, that uh, the trial judge would at least be able to go back and see, you know, or, or have from their own memory what was actually done in the case, um, you know, what pleadings were filed and, and things like that. But I certainly think also a, an outside and experienced attorney would be able to, would be able to do that as well in terms of considering vouchers because I think what has happened, particularly with the, the budget issues that arose in the past few years, is I think that certainly the, uh, the courts... Uh, the judges as public servants have felt uh, a certain amount of pressure to be stewards of the public money, so to speak, and that it is their role now to try and reduce or limit that. And, and, uh, and one of the easiest ways to do is to cut, to cut uh, vouchers, I think, if, if they feel, well, that was you know, unnecessary, that was not necessary in this case. And, whether, you know, and I think a lot of times, though, I haven't had it happen to me uh, personally, uh, I did have a voucher cut one time by the trial judge because he felt I had spent too much time communicating with the family of the defendant. And I sought a meeting with, with the judge to explain, well, you know, judges, we're dealing oftentimes with a client that has absolutely no criminal history, and you are having to tell this person now, you're looking at a minimum 10 years in prison, and the best deal I can get you is maybe going to be five years. And so certainly in communicating with the family, that helps in terms of client control and really helping to resolve this case without an unnecessary trial. I didn't win the argument. My voucher was still cut. But I think those are some of the, the things that I think as, as trial lawyers, um, it, it, it's the idea, well, the judge didn't really understand what, what was involved in this case. And perhaps another attorney that, that has the experience handling these kinds of cases would. On, on that note, do the attorneys, and if you know, do the judges know what resources are available to them? For example, uh, our district, uh, which does have a, a managing attorney, supervising attorney who does the vouchers, uh, will regularly call Defender Services and say, we've got someone billing for this. What do you think of about it. Do do the attorneys ever communicate with Defender Services? Do they know that's something they can do? Do you think that some kind of greater uh, training, because we get zero training on, on vouchers, uh, would be helpful? Or are you mostly encountering judges who simply say, I don't care what the rules are, I don't care what 230 says, uh, I'm not going to pay for this kind of Thing. Do you have a, a thought on on that? I, I think my sense is the judges decide what they what they want to do on it. I, I've called before uh, with the uh, the uh, person that was in charge of the CJ um, voucher submission. She's leaving the position now uh, to go to the Department of Justice. But most of the time, my communications would be actually, can you give me an update on where this voucher is at? Because it's been 90 days or you know 120 days since I submitted it. Uh, but generally not uh, communicating directly about reasons for the, the voucher being cut. Um, yeah, I was just going to say just personally, um, as high up as I've ever gone is just to our budgeting attorney and just had a discussion with her um, about whether or not something was approved or something along those lines. And certainly that person has had um, suggestions as well. Um, just from her broad experience in, in criminal defense. But higher than that, I have, I have never, was not even aware that there were budgeting people or billing people that were available to us. Neither was I. I I've had meetings with judges about vouchers and, and answered, like I said, there was a, a learning curve for one of our new judges. And he appreciated the fact that I came in and sat down and explained some things. And he was just trying to get a feel for what's reasonable. Um, uh, but then you've got other judges who like you said, frankly, don't care, and they're going to cut it. I spend uh, a, a significant amount of time communicating with a couple of two or three CJA panel lawyers who are who are experienced. And so if I have a question about something I'm uh, trying to do, I will reach out to them and uh, get their input on whether they've encountered something of similar nature. I also communicate frequently with one of the uh, public defenders uh, uh, in El Paso, uh, I get his intake on uh, 
uh, how they may handle uh, a certain issue or a certain uh, request for uh, services. Uh, and of course, they don't they don't have to explain or justify their reasons. But uh, there is I'd reach out to not only the public defender's office, well, to a public defender there, uh, but I reach out to two or three other uh, seasoned uh, CJA panel lawyers and frequently talk to them about uh, specific fact scenarios, uh, cases, uh, and, and I know they reach out to me too, uh, just to try to get a better feel for what we think needs to be done. Uh, but I think every case is, stands on its own, own two feet and you have to do what you feel uh, is, is important for that case and for that client. And, uh, and I, I've, I've never, I've always listened to what other lawyers have to say if, if I've asked them. Uh, but the bottom line is, is in the end of the day, I have to make the call what I think is necessary to represent my client. And if I get a pushback from a judge, then I get a pushback. Uh, but that's going to happen. Mr. President. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I just I want to thank each of you for being here. Um, I understand that, you know, your time here is giving up time away from your practice and from making money for your families to support yourselves. And so I really appreciate that and totally understand it. Um, also, uh, recognize that, uh, you know, it takes a lot of courage, I think, for you guys to talk about the things that you're speaking about. But I hope you recognize as well that your input is vitally important to the mission of this committee, as you can tell from the subject matter involved. Um, certainly the sort of, uh, to borrow a, a phrase from um, the, former, uh, the uh, former chairperson of the Defender Services Advisory Group, panel attorneys are the redheaded stepchild of the uh, criminal <laughs> defense system. And so the input that you give to this committee is, is very, very vital. Um, when you talk about the administration of the, of the program, there are really two components, I think. One is just that management component, who's going to do what and make sure it happens when it needs to happen. And secondly, and, and as with anything that involves the expenditure of public funds, there's an accountability or oversight function that's there. And so um, Congress saw fit to place those functions primarily within the judiciary and within the judges who handle the cases. And that's been obviously a big topic that we've discussed. And so I want to direct your attention specifically to the oversight component and have you think about that. I'd like to pose this question to each of you. And that is, um, you know, if, if there's nothing magic about who does that uh, and there's nothing magic about a judge having that responsibility, is there any reason that you have to believe that if that voucher review function was placed into uh, the role of the federal public defender or some designee that is a part of the Federal Public Defender's Office, as uh, has been described by Ms. Morgan, I think, that the, the, the CJA attorney administrator that you all use, if that's the kind of person that's involved with this, do you think that that would cause significant or serious concerns, that, that, that there is no oversight, that now everything's just a rubber stamp, and that, uh, you know, the public funds are just going to be thrown out the window, so to speak? And the second part of that question is just, uh, do you think that that particular process would have more of a benefit to the independence and other functions of CJA counsel if it were placed with someone who has more of a connection to the defense function as opposed to the judiciary? And perhaps just down the line, Mr. Esper, maybe starting with you. Uh, I, 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 I don't feel comfortable uh, uh, if, it's, if the review process or the administrative process is being run by the, uh, someone from the in connection with the defender services. Now, from the standpoint of their understanding, uh, they're looking at a case through the same lenses that we are. Uh, that is a benefit. But by the same token, you know, many of those individuals that are in that office, they don't, they don't have the responsibilities of maintaining a law office. They don't have the, the responsibilities of paying overhead, uh, of, of paying for uh, services that are necessary. Uh, so from that standpoint, I, I don't think that they would be good at administering uh, our vouchers. But from the but, but from looking at a case through the lenses of a defense lawyer, uh, it would be beneficial. Uh, I still believe that, uh, and I think uh, Corey said it pretty well. Uh, I think if the judiciary administers from the standpoint of controlling who's on the on, on the panels. Uh, I think that would be a big help, at least as far as serving as gatekeepers. But I still believe that 
we need some autonomy uh, as as CJA redheaded stepchild. Uh, we need some autonomy to, to grow and develop and uh, and and not be treated like a redheaded stepchild, so to speak. I, I'm not sure I answered both parts, but I tried to. Thank you. I like the idea of having the FPD or a CJA administrator have oversight. I do, I think that if you have someone that's been in that position that manages their own budget, I can't imagine what the outcry would be because they're going to be subject to the same review and audit uh, that they're already subject to. So I don't think there would be any outcry in that regard. Uh, I certainly think it's a benefit for the reasons that I've stated before. I mean, we have got someone who's done the work, who's done the practice, who understands. Uh, I think yesterday, or I think it was yesterday, there, there was the possibility of a conflict coming up. Maybe they had a co-defendant in the case. And I think in that in that way, there's there's got to be a mechanism set up just like there would be in any large law firm. You've got someone else that can handle it, or there's a an independent CJA administrator that steps in. Um, but I absolutely love that idea, and I think it would uh, remove a lot of the obstacles that we face. Um, I'm still thinking about the question that you asked me about who pays for our CJA administrator. And as I answered that question, I thought, is that really the right answer? If it's not, I'll get back with the committee and let the committee know the actual truth about that. <laughs> I didn't speak the actual truth. <laughs> um, <laughs> you didn't put you under. <laughs> Shoo. Um, but I, I agree. I, I like the idea of having somebody um, independently review it. And I think um, we have to get away from the notion that simply because perhaps they are housed within the federal public defender's office, that that means that they are somehow controlled by the federal public defender or that, you know, there's going to be a conflict of interest. I know in our own system, um, the CJ administrator does not have um, any access to the federal defender computer systems. And her computer system and her assistance computer system is completely independent. Like, no public defender in her, her office is set way down the hall from everybody else, and nobody else can, um, like, get into her system, and she can't get into anybody else's. It's all, you know, very password protected and secure and that kind of thing. Um, it, I believe that it works for us because we did not just make this um, an, a truly administrative function. We actually required somebody who had a background in criminal defense so that they knew the kind of work that criminal defense attorneys generally need to do in the defense of their client. Because I think when the overall test is reasonableness, the only way that you can do that is if you know what actually is required in, in circumstances given that there is an amount of deference that has to be given to the attorneys to manage and run their own cases. So I, I don't think that it's an issue to have, in fact, I like the idea of having somebody separate um, uh, do that. I think it still does provide uh, the oversight because I don't know that, I mean, unless we want to say that, um, you know, we think that an Article Three judge has... Um, you know, more credibility than, you know, a criminal defense lawyer of 25 years um, who's conducted herself with a high level of integrity. And if you, if you want to say that you can't measure those two people equally because there isn't a process that, you know, you have to go through um, to become an Article Three judge, and therefore only Article Three judges can have sort of that level of oversight, um, then I suppose that the answer would be, I, you lose oversight, but I don't believe that that's true. I think when you hire people that have the level of integrity and um, expertise and education um, to do a job, I think you can be satisfied that they are doing the job that they are tasked with. Can I interrupt you to ask, just with respect to that process in the in the District of Kansas, um, does, even though right now that CJ administrator cannot statutorily have the final word a bit about approving that voucher, does the existence of that position, even in the current system where the judge has the ultimate signatory authority, does that increase the level of comfort, if you will, or, um, or credibility of the vouchers when they actually do go to the judges? Yeah, I think it works. Um in both ways. I think one, um, it gives the, the CJA lawyers 
a um, feeling that that somebody who knows what the work is required um, to represent somebody who is accused that 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 there's somebody who actually understands and appreciates that function reviewing it so it gives the lawyers a sense of confidence but I also um, think that the court because our court um, is definitely very supportive of this position um, that they are very supportive of this particular individual um, that then if, if she has given it like her green light that I think that they look at it um, and only if there is something that really jumps out at them will they say let me have you know let me have another question or let me find out a little bit more information about that. I will also say, and I think that this is important, is that when you do have sort of an independent person in that process, it makes it harder for the court to say, I'm not going to pay for budgeting hours, or I'm not going to pay for travel to and from the jail that is an hour and a half away from your facility. Because they then are talking to someone who says, well, judge, the rules require you to do this that way. So there's almost an, a measure of accountability on the court's part, taking away sort of that um, arbitrary, I'm not going to pay for something when you have a separate person that's in the middle like that. So I think it's a great solution at and do this you, point. And do you think that structure has any impact on the quality of representation in the District of Kansas and perhaps maybe compare that to your other district that you practice in where they apparently don't have that same structure? Um, you know, I think that um, the quality of representation that we have in um, the District of Kansas is, is not just because of having a CJA administrator position. Um, I think it's because we have a federal defender who believes in a very strong collaborative alliance with the CJA panel and is working to make sure that they have the training resources so that they can that they have the skill level to represent um, various individuals and to make sure that they have the training to know what resources are available. Our courts um, will periodically pop in at our training and say, look, you guys, we know that you're not using investigators to the extent that you could be using them. We want to see you start using investigators. And, you know, in essence saying, hey, start spending money. No, they're not saying that, but what they are saying is like, look, we want to support you in doing your job to your very best of your ability. Um, and I think um, the dynamic of having all of these different pieces together really serves to um, make the relationships between the various stakeholders in the in in the process um, more more collaborative where they can be. In the other district, in the Western District of Missouri where I practice, I feel like there's a complete disconnect. Um, every judge kind of operates um, separately in terms of what they think that they are willing to approve or not approve. Um, the administrative um, folks that are that first level of screening when we submit our e-voucher are um, more clerical in nature. They've obviously gotten a directive from the court about what they're okay with and, and not okay with. And um, that doesn't filter down necessarily in any kind of organized fashion to the CJA lawyers. It just gets a clerk telling you, um, be more explicit on your voucher. Instead of saying travel to and from the courthouse, say it was round trip travel from your office to the courthouse for a meeting. Um, you know, so it's you get some interesting um, feedback when you have more of a, a clerical person in, in that person. And I think overall, the sense of the lawyers in the Western District of Missouri, and there's a lot that practice in both districts, is that they don't have um, they don't have the support, um, that they don't have the training. And then you get like, I don't give a, I don't really care that much. Um, you really start to see kind of that trickle-down effect, whereas in the District of Kansas, the lawyers are who are on that panel, they want to be on that panel. They want to take care of those people whose lives have truly been entrusted to them. I think from the CJ lawyers I've talked to, that there is um, a feeling that there isn't consistency necessarily in terms of how vouchers are considered, that there are certain judges that uh, will never cut a voucher and that others that you need to be very vigilant or even reduce your voucher um, when you before you submit it. But I agree that, uh, you know, whether it's through the defender's office or an independent person, I think as long as that person has experience in handling these types of cases and they look at it through that lens in considering a voucher, I think that that uh, 
is preferable to the current system. If anything, particularly if there's going to if there's an entry or some time that's being challenged or questioned, I think the attorney that uh, that has submitted the voucher at least feels that there may be someone on equal footing where they can go and meet with this person to 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 uh, review that or or you know make an argument uh, in support of it. Where I think that currently under the current system, there's somewhat of a feeling of intimidation. You know, you're not going to really go back and challenge a, an Article Three judge uh, too extensively on uh, if the judge is saying, uh, you know, that they're going to cut your voucher. In fact, I think a lot of attorneys probably wouldn't even take the, the meeting if it's offered. They'll just be, no, Your Honor, thank you. I appreciate what you're approving and, and just go with it like that. Okay, thank you. And like Mr. Friendsley, I do want to thank you. I, I know you have, if not better things to do, you have other things to, uh, to do today. And so we appreciate it. One of the reasons for the public hearings is so that we can uh, hear from those on the ground in, in the field. And uh, you've been very forthcoming today, and that's, that's helpful to us. But, um, one of our charges is uh, to make sure that we understand what are uh, issues and maybe what aren't issues. Uh, one of the things that I heard you say, Mr. Sapin, I've, I've heard it a couple times, uh, today that voucher review is maybe taking longer than it should, that it, it may be exceeding 90 days or 120 days. Um, and I guess I would want to ask each one of you, is, is that an issue? Um, is that a common issue? Um, because that's one of the things that we haven't necessarily uh, honed in on at this point in time, but we may be doing some of that. Well, and so let me, I'll address it since I, since I brought that, but I don't think that it is a significant issue necessarily in New Mexico. Uh, certainly, I think that um, most of the judges, and of course, they're busy as well also, and they, you know, as, as some of the judges have already stated, they would gladly give up that uh, part of the, the process because certainly I think it takes away from really what their charge is in terms of, of handling their, their caseload. But so I think Overall, it's not uh, that big of an issue necessarily in New Mexico. I think it may be just a couple of, of instances or a couple of judges who take a little bit longer at times uh, to, uh, to have vouchers uh, reviewed and, and approved uh, than others. But I think overall, at least in my experience, most of the time it, it flows pretty smoothly. I mean, it, you know, certainly... Um, I think we'd all like to get paid within 30 days, uh, you know, if, if possible. That doesn't always happen, but certainly I think uh, for the most part it's not more than 60 days that I've, I've seen, um, uh, you know, vouchers taken. And it's, it's the rare occasion where it's, it's taken somewhat longer. And, and again, some of those are also if the voucher uh, is over the statutory limit, you've had to submit an explanation letter, I'm, I, I think the court takes a little bit more time in. In, in that uh, review. That's been my experience. And the second part of the question that I'm going to ask yeah. each one of you would be the timing, but, and also whether you have whether you have had the e-voucher system yet and whether that has uh, helped or, or hindered. Hopefully it's helped. But. We, we have had the training, and so we are. Uh, there was a deadline. I think we had September 30th of a deadline to get in any outstanding vouchers in so that we could then uh, move to the new system. Uh, admittedly, Your Honor, my office worked very hard. We didn't get them all in, but I think we submitted like 13 or 14 vouchers that had been pending. Uh, and we had been somewhat short staffed. We got those in, but in terms of the e-voucher system, I think I was a little bit leery of the of the process because I am I was used to using an Excel spreadsheet, which we'd go in, uh, you know, punch in our time and, and now we're having to log in. But as I've gotten used to the system, it's not really, I think, that much um, more difficult, and I and I'm hopeful in the long run that it it makes things uh, run a bit more smoothly from submission to approval. Ms. Moore. Um, well, I use eVoucher in all the courts, both at the district court level and in the appellate court um, level, and I love it. Um, so it has been a great system in the Western District of Missouri. We are still in the um, uh, transition phase of that, and so I am hopeful that. Um, uh, some of the delay that we are seeing in vouchers maybe is going to be eliminated. Historically, uh, that has been a district that had a very slow turnaround time for vouchers. Um, it still is slow. I mean, I can tell you right now I have a voucher that um, is 60 days out and it hasn't even made it up to the circuit yet. So um, to me, that is slow, especially when these cases um, 
um, are just being paid at, at the end of the representation. Um, we do have an interim, as I mentioned previously, in the I'm District gonna, of I'm Kansas. Ask you about that. Tell, tell me about. Uh, yeah, in the in the District of Kansas, we have set up a function so that um, when your the amount of time that you have in a case, and now it's so much easier to track for a lot of lawyers because of the e voucher. Um, when it hits a threshold amount, um, and so it's just dollar amount. The threshold is dollar amount. Yeah, the threshold is is dollar and in, in two months. And so you basically can submit a voucher every every two months um, when you hit. Um, I think it's in like two thousand um, dollar increments. So it helps lawyers who, especially if they have a large number of them, or especially if they've been in trial and they've if they've put in a ton of time in that particular case, that that they are not then strung out financially because they have to wait, you know, six months, nine months, 12 more months before their case is, is ultimately resolved. Thank you. Ms. I will say historically, the payments in the Western District of Texas were much more delayed than I've experienced in the District of New Mexico. And that could just be a function of the number of cases. I, I, I don't have an explanation for that. Um, with the e-voucher system, we've been doing it for a couple of months now in New Mexico. I look back at my paralegal because she's the one that is in charge of helping me keep on, on track with that. Um, and I've, I've noticed a much more rapid turnaround in getting paid. Um, I have not yet submitted one in the Western District of Texas, so I can't speak to that, but I hope that it increases. Uh, one of the examples I gave in my written testimony was about a voucher that was cut um, uh, for because the trial judge did not feel that it was, I guess he, he reduced it because he thought that I charged more, which was still under the statutory cap, than what a retained lawyer charged for a co-defendant in the case. Um, that voucher sat on his desk, I was told, by the uh, clerk's office for seven or eight months. It just every time I called to check on it, it was under review, under review, under review. And when I finally received a letter with his explanation of why he was intending to reduce it, I you know, it's like, you know, now I've got to wait another, because I was going to challenge that. I, I didn't feel like him comparing my voucher to privately retained counsel was proper. Um, I don't feel like, you know, what maybe that private lawyer did compared to what I did was the same. I mean, there were all kinds of issues. And so that delayed, I ended up not getting paid until 13 months after that case had been completed. So that's another reason you don't always challenge because you know that that's going to cause delays. Now I will say in complex cases in the Western District of Texas, when it's, um, you've done your case budget, you Interim, interim payments are something we always ask for, and I've never had one denied. In the District of New Mexico, anytime it's declared a complex case, when the judge signs that order, they put interim payments will be allowed. And so that helps tremendously because that really, I mean, you, you can't wait for a two-year case to wrap up to get paid. One of the follow-up question I had for you, your, your testimony earlier today was a compelling 60% of the time your vouchers have... That was my review in preparing for this. And, and I admit some of those were clerical, some of those were... Uh, and I say clerical in that it's a clerk reviewing it. And again, I have a problem with that because you have a clerk who doesn't necessarily understand maybe what it takes to do one of these cases. And they're, they're reducing something because of, they think it's personal in nature. When I call the jail to set up a conference call, I don't believe that's personal in nature. I'm not calling to chit chat and have lunch with that person. That's, that's setting, somebody that's clerical. That's a clerical doing. reduction that we don't have the chance to address. We, we've, we're never given the chance to address those types of reductions. So the, the follow-up question is, have, have you changed your practice yes, at all as a, as I have. a result of that? I, after sitting down with the, the new judge in our district and, and kind of getting his, what he wanted, and, uh, you know, he wants more detail. He wants to know why, what, what are you talking about when you talk to the client's family? What put that in your voucher? When I took that back to some of my colleagues, they say, I'm not going to put that in there. That's going to violate uh, some confidences. That's going to, I, I'm just not going to do it. I just won't bill for it is basically what I heard from the majority of them. But he just asked for more detail. And so there, there's, you either don't bill for it because you know they're not going to pay it, or you get creative in the way that you you do your description. I guess my underline was: Have you have you changed? I have. But have you changed the nature of your practice? For example, one, you were removed from at least one judge had uh, removed you because you talked to a, a family member in his or her opinion too much. Right. Um, have you changed your practice? Uh, no. That's right. Okay. No, I still take clients' calls, phone, uh, family members' calls. Uh, I, I just think that's important. To keep the client happy, you've got to keep the family happy a lot of the times, and, it, and they go hand in hand in, in representing your client. One of, the, one of the items in your written submission was about this cap on misdemeanor cases, mm -hmm. $200? That was the time, and Judge 
Cardone can speak to it if it's changed. Uh, it's been several years since I've been on the misdemeanor panel. But yes, that was the, the cap that was in place for a, a, just a simple, a simple again, um, illegal entry case. Um, the way that it was done in the Western District is that you would be appointed four, five, six clients at a time. And the, I guess the thinking was that you would go to the facility, you would interview them all at the same time, so you would bill one, one trip there, one trip back. Uh, it, and they felt like that was enough to compensate you for your, because the, the hearing would be held, the plea hearing would be held on the same day for all the clients if, you know, if everything went as planned. Um, and I just, you know, I, I got a call from one of the judges, like, I think you're billing too much. I'm, you know, I, well, I, unfortunately, I had to talk to this client a little bit longer than I had to talk to that one. Or this, this one, unfortunately, got moved to a different facility that's 100 miles away, and I had to go. And it just, I felt like I was having to explain more than it was honestly worth. Mr. Harris. Yes, Judge Gerard, I've, uh, I do like the e-voucher system. Uh, it, uh, it seems like it's a much smoother transition. Uh, it it kind of had a little few glitches uh, getting off the ground. Uh, but in the Western District of Texas, I historically have never had uh, a voucher take longer than 60 days to be paid. Uh, typically, they're paid in, in that time frame. They're very rarely they paid within 30 days, but usually it's 30 to 60 days they're paid. Uh, the e-voucher system, uh, I know I talked to one of the reviewing clerks just recently, and she was thrilled with it because uh, now she doesn't have to read my handwriting anymore <laughs> on my worksheets. Uh, but uh, I am, I guess, fortunate in that I've never had a voucher cut by a federal judge. Uh, there was an attempt made by one of the federal judges, and, and I'll relate this story, uh, to cut my, fe my budget. And the reason was is that there was there was like 11 defendants, and it was a sex trafficking case, and you had a defendant number one, and you had uh, five lower tier level uh, individuals, all males, and then you had five lower tier females, all uh, defendants, and I was representing one of the females, and uh, the judge, as as the justification for cutting my voucher, said it wasn't consistent with the vouchers of the other four lawyers who represented the other four females. And so I took the time to look up and see what I did differently. And uh, number one, I, uh, my client uh, was arrested out of district, uh, was granted bond, but the government uh, you know, uh, moved to stay the, ba the, the bond or review by the court of original jurisdiction. So I had to file and, and did file an 18 page memorandum uh, under 3145 where my client should get a bond and then number two, I, I also pointed out to the judge that I filed a 25-page sentencing memorandum uh, going through all the 3553A factors that U.S. probation doesn't really go into depth about, uh, at least in our, our division. And, uh, and so I pointed out to this judge, look, these other lawyers didn't do that for starters. Uh, and number two, I don't think that... Uh, any lawyer's services should be compared with another lawyer's services just because you're representing similar defendants in a case. And I put it in writing, took the time to do it, and the judge reversed himself on it. So I, I want to ask a follow-up question about vouchers. And I want to ask, for each of you, your experience with the circuit courts. In other words, we've been talking a lot about district courts. Have any of you had any experience with circuit court vouchering? And... Um, whether those have gotten paid, cut, how long they take, what problems or successes have you had? We'll start with you. Th thank, thank you, Judge. I've had that experience a couple of times, and it's actually been with the same Article Three judge, and what, I, what has usually occurred is I would get a call from the courtroom deputy um, asking that I prepare a letter that explains why uh, this particular voucher was over the limit uh, because the court was going to submit it to the, the circuit for consideration. And then the court uh, then incorporated the information I provided in a letter. But my experience has been very favorable. The, the judge, in both instances, recommended approval of the uh, the voucher, and and uh, the vouchers were approved. Uh, one is still pending, actually, payment now. It went up to the circuit. Yes, it went up right, and so that's been that's been my experience. It's only happened a couple of times. Um, I have submitted uh, several vouchers to the circuit, either for direct appellate work um, that I was doing or because it was a, 
voucher that was in excess of the cap. Um, my experience in um, the 10th Circuit, um, they have uh, approved all of my vouchers that have been submitted. I haven't had anything cut in the 10th Circuit. Um, in the 8th Circuit, um, I have had cuts in the 8th Circuit. And the 8th Circuit, um, I will say, historically um, had a, um, did not approve excess vouchers. Um, I have not in recent times um, had a voucher cut now that there has been a change um, in in the judge that administers those. So I think in terms of what the, the Eighth Circuit does, um, I at least personally have not seen that. However, um, my uh, law partner who does do uh, death penalty representation or litigation um, has her death penalty vouchers cut. Um, we have challenged those. Um, one time it was by about a third um, and when we challenged it, we got a little bit more money, but not the vast majority of it. What so, was, what was the reasoning? Uh, um, it was just questioning whether the work that was done in, ed, in end stage litigation was uh, proper or not. There's a real uh, split on the uh, court as to uh, their views on the death penalty generally, and I think sometimes it is reflected in the voucher. And you're referring to the Eighth Circuit? Then? Yes. In my direct appellate work with both the 10th and the 5th, generally my vouchers are not cut. I, I've, I've been, they've been pretty, again, clerical here and there, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 maybe. Um, however, when it's a case that exceeds the, the case maximums, I referenced one of them in my written testimony where the circuit judge said that I spent too much time preparing for sentencing, and that was one where my, my client was facing life in prison, did get life in prison. It was a 11-day trial, a 90-page PSR, and there was a lot of things brought up in the PSR, relevant conduct, um, that they were, uh, the U.S. attorney was attempting to enhance um, the arguments for sentencing. And we spent quite a bit of time fighting that and requesting documents. And, and the circuit judge ultimately, I guess, somewhat reversed himself. He, he gave us, I think, half the time that we had asked for, he, he reversed it. But I still received a reduction, and that's, that's just one specific example. I have had one uh, voucher cut in the Fifth Circuit, and uh, in historical context, it was it related to a prior case. Well, it wasn't related to a prior case, but I had a was court appointed on a case. There was an appellate waiver. The the, one, the individual wanted to uh, appeal his sentence, uh, and so what I did is I filed an Anders brief saying there are no non frivolous issues here. The U.S. Attorney's Office I already contacted them. They're going to re re rely on the appellate waiver as a bar. Uh, and so I filed an Anders brief, and I got a, I got an order from the Fifth Circuit saying, no, we think there's some issues here. You need to file a brief. So I did. I filed a, a full-blown brief, I ch and I challenged that, the, 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 uh, that his plea was not voluntary. My voucher got paid. So the next case I get, which is almost the same thing, guilty plea, plea agreement, appellate waiver. So this time I said, I'm not going to file an Anders brief. I'm just going to file a full-blown brief because I don't want to kick back again. And... Uh, of course, the U.S. Attorney's Office filed a motion to stay the briefing period. They filed a motion to dismiss, citing the appellate waiver. And, of course, my brief was about 40 pages long. And uh, so the court granted the motion to dismiss. And so when I submitted my voucher, which was about $7,000, it got cut to $2,500 because they basically stated, well, the opinion was only a, a one-paragraph opinion, and you didn't need to write such a lengthy brief. So... Uh, I guess I've learned it's better to file the Anders brief so you don't get your voucher cut. But that that was the reason for, that it got cut. Are you uh, facing issues with regard to the, the definition of the uh, extended or complex uh, statutory maximum? Uh, do you have some judges who just think that every case in the district is the ordinary case and so virtually nothing is extended or complex? Or are they not... Uh, agreeing perhaps with what you might think the definition uh, should be? Is there uh, a suggestion that we should make <coughs> about uh, either getting rid of the statutory maximum or changing or maybe uh, broadening that definition so that judges would uh, be a little bit more free if they don't feel free now to say, uh, yes, this is something that, exceed, that can exceed the statutory maximum? Well, I recently had um, a court uh, 
question on a supervised release case because that exceeded the statutory maximum, which I think is 2,100, 2,200. And it was, it was one of the rare times that I have exceeded on a, on a supervised release case, but there were, uh, there were some issues that uh, I explained to the court uh, about that. So I don't know if on the statutory, I mean, on supervised release cases, if that there shouldn't be some um, review of maybe that uh, statutory uh, maximum being uh, increased. I think on the cases where I've found that there's an issue, obviously on the complex cases, it's not as long as they're deemed complex, but there are certain uh, drug cases I've had which may be, uh, you know, two or three defendants not designated as complex, but still involved significant legal issues, legal research, sentencing issues, where um, I think my vouchers have been questioned uh, more often. I, I generally will always try and submit as detailed a letter as possible. I try and, on all my vouchers, put as much detail as possible. I'm not going to put, if it's legal research, just legal research. I usually will spell out, you know, maybe two or three lines on the entry as to what what was the, uh, the issue that was being researched. But uh, I think those cases sometimes present some difficulty both for the attorneys and the courts when they're reviewing the vouchers that, you know, why did you go over the the limit, um, even though there are, you know, valid reasons for doing so, but, you know, the case wasn't complex. I think that's been my experience where there's an issue in terms of the statutory limit. I think the reality is that more and more cases in the federal system are extended and complex, and so they're not the exception anymore, that they are really the norm. Um, in any given case, I mean, it is rare for me to represent a sing uh you know, a one defendant case. Um, most of my cases that I have, I would say, end up being um, anywhere from 10 to 25 defendants in the case. Um, it doesn't necessarily get declared complex, but the work is complex and it is extended. And I think some of the, pro the problem that you start seeing is when this becomes the norm and this is the definition for what is above the cap is supposed to be more exceptional, um, then you have judges that are are, are put in kind of a quandary of how to to deal with that. I am somebody who does believe that, um, that the cap that we have right now, at least in, in normal litigation, not speaking to um, you know misdemeanor cases or anything else, I don't believe that that um, I don't believe that that accurately reflects the type of work that has to be put into um, criminal cases. <clears throat> and I think that any case that requires any kind of workup at the trial level, and if you are doing your job as an attorney and representing your client as an individual in that sentencing process, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that your client um, has every opportunity to get something other than a guideline sentence. I agree with everything she just said. I, I think the complex case is more the norm than it used to be. The only time really that I have a single defendant case is when it's a le an illegal reentry case. Um, every other time it's it's a multi-defendant drug case or, or, or whatever. And, and so getting them designated complex is, when it's a wiretap case, it's just automatic. I mean, the judge is going to grant that, for example. But it, when you've got a three or four defendant conspiracy case, um, they don't necessarily view that as complex. And so it's something that what I do when I submit my voucher is I'll submit a letter and I'll detail what, why I had to go a little bit over the case maximum in this case or why it presented a different issue or a more difficult issue that needed additional research. Um, and the judges have been pretty receptive to having that done if they're not going to deem it complex at the outset. But I, I do think the case maximums need to be raised. I agree with Melanie and Corey. And I also just wanted to add to the fact that many times uh, you have, and I think this is something you have to make it known to the to the trial judge if if the trial judge doesn't already know it. Is sometimes you get difficult clients uh, that uh, that you're appointed to represent, uh, and I know that uh, I've gotten. Uh, I, I know in our division, uh, the judges have the authority. You know, they'll they'll pretty much cap it at three three appointments. And uh, for some reason, I get calls a lot of times for that third appointment, <laughs> and they're usually difficult clients. And so you have to invest a lot more time, a lot more patience, uh, and sometimes you have to get a lot more assertive uh, with these individuals. And so sometimes that does take up a lot of time, and you have to explain that. And that, that'll take it over the statutory maximum many times. And so when you factor that in, and I think that's a lot of times what a lot of judges don't see is that you've just got a difficult client 
uh, that is just fighting you uh, at every juncture. Not only are you having to fight with the United States Attorney's Office many times, uh, but uh, you're having to fight with your client. And, uh, and that can present some real problems and real challenges and is very time consuming and exhausting. And I think, uh, you know, you need to be compensated for that. You, you've all spoke to the, the um, and I believe there's consensus about the, the, uh, the case maximum caps being too low. Do you have an opinion about the, the maximums on expert services, the caps? They need to be raised. I, I don't know to what. I mean, I very rarely, honestly, ask for them or have them granted. But what I what I hear from, um, for example, the interpreters. I think the interpreters' um, hourly rate needs to be increased. It's not commensurate with what they could make if they were in private practice doing it. And I think that that needs to be, uh, in particular, the, the interpreter that I work with. I mean, he's seen a slight increase in the CJA panel attorney rate, and that, that interpreter rate has remained the same for I don't know how many years. I think that needs to be taken into consideration. I know they're not granted in all districts, but in the districts in, in which they are used, they, they need to be compensated fairly, and um, I would agree in raising the, the maximums across the board. I, I agree. I'm sorry. I agree as well. I, I don't know what it should be raised to, but as I had mentioned earlier about the interpreters, I had difficulty on occasion finding a contract interpreter that was willing to do it for the CJ rate. So. Um, I was just going to say that I, I look at um, the type of expert services we use in, in a couple of different categories. We use them for investigative purposes, um, we use them for interpretive purposes, and then we also use them for what is true expert services, lots of times in the area of um, you know for some kind of forensic science or some mental health issue. When you start going beyond either interpretive or investigative, or you need multiple types of service in each type of, in, in the representation, I think that's really where you run into a problem with the cap, especially with mental health professionals um, that you know can charge um, a, a significant amount of money. I have one person who's not truly an expert in my case yet, but that's how I'm submitting it. She's the treating physician, and every time I talk to her, um, it's in 15-minute in increments, and she charges me 75 bucks. Um, I, I can't control that. I have to have that information from that particular individual, and yet I'm mindful that she's eating up what I might need for investigative purposes. So um, I'll give you just one example in the Western District of Missouri. And again, we have a different, um, a different judge administering at the circuit level, but obviously the opinion of the circuit level filters down to what the district court judges and the magistrate um, judges do. And I had a person who I believed had significant mental health issues that needed a full psychological um, workup, not just something uh, piecemeal. And I was told that I could have, um, you know, at, at that time it was 2,000 bucks. And I had bargained and negotiated with this person um, about her services and she would not go below four. And so what the judge says, well, you can do it. We're not going to we're not going to get approval in advance, um, but you'll be on the hook for that two thousand that two thousand dollars. I can't afford to be on the hook for that two thousand dollars. And so um, I, I do think that um, the need for expert services is becoming greater and greater as um, as technology becomes more sophisticated, um, as just forensics become more sophisticated. But that also is driving up the cost. And so I think that cap must be addressed. I would agree uh, with Melanie, especially uh, in, with respect to uh, expert services involving uh, technology, uh, because so many more and more courtrooms are going to uh, technology to introduce evidence. And you know, when you're an old school lawyer like myself who likes paper, uh, the transition is not necessarily an easy one. And so I try, uh, especially in retained cases, and I'm trying to push forward in, in uh, CJA cases, <coughs> is when you have a complex case with thousands and thousands of documents uh, that you need to have retrieved in a, in a heartbeat. Uh, a lot of the younger lawyers, at least I, I know two or three or four of them, that are really good at, they may not be skilled lawyers in the courtroom yet, but they're really good with the technology portion of it. And they may not necessarily have to be a lawyer, There's just be someone that's really uh, uh, extremely good with technology uh, I think there's there's a need for those types of services, and I do believe that there is a need for expert uh, witnesses testimony with respect to punishment, uh, because more and more, uh, it will certainly over 90% of cases end up 
<laughs> with some increment of punishment. And uh, I think that so many individuals uh, don't have uh, the level of expertise that they need to create the proper evidence to present to a judge that reflects why 3553A factors are important, why a non-guideline sentence is important. And I think that if you have expert services, and, and sometimes you just have to push uh, for somebody to come in or, or present some sort of documentation or an affidavit or, or a report as to why this individual uh, merits a departure or a non-guideline sentence, you know, you need to have the funds to do that. And uh, I think it's crucial, especially since so many cases, like I said, over 90% end up with some uh, type of sentence uh, in a criminal case. That's a quick question to that. I, I just wanted to ask Mrs. Harper Valdez and Mr. Esper about your experience in the two capital 2254s that each of you did. And the first question I'd ask each of you is when you were appointed on I, I think it was only one each of you took, but were you appointed together with an experienced capital habeas lawyer? I can answer that. The, the lawyer that was appointed with me had experience, trial experience, uh, as uh, in representing death penalty cases. But not capital habeas. But not capital habeas. And, uh, and so we were both kind of uh, grasping for whatever we could to, to figure the right way to do this. Understood. And you I was appointed um, with another lawyer. Neither one of us had um, capital habeas experience. Um, we learned as best we could as we went along. We sought the advice of attorneys from all over the state um, and, and did the best that we could. The other question I had was about funding. Um, in each of those cases, the question I'd have for each of you is, did you prepare budgets and did you request expert services and what happened to those requests? Okay, well, the case I have is pending. Okay. And, and we have prepared a budget uh, that's been submitted to the court. Uh, it, it, and we, we actually... Uh, yeah, I don't mean to inquire about anything that's confidential, so I, I didn't realize the case was still pending. No, it's still pending, but we uh, we did get we did seek the services of a third lawyer who has expertise in death pen state death penalty writs, and the court was gracious enough to allow for a third lawyer to come into the case. We've submitted an extent, and this person really has some expertise uh, in that area, and we have submitted an extensive budget plan uh, asking for funds for expert witnesses uh, it really opened my eyes uh, to the necessity of training for somebody in the El Paso division uh, to receive some really comprehensive training to handle these types of cases. We did not submit a budget at the time. That just wasn't the practice in the district. Um, but we were instructed, ordered to submit monthly interim vouchers. And that's how the judge kept control of the budget, I, I would guess. All right. Um, let's go ahead. And is there anything in, that you, Mr. Esper, would like to tell us that you haven't had the opportunity to tell us? Uh, I think that uh, the main issue that I think uh, is important uh, for this committee to understand is that Training is, is very important uh, for the CJA panel members. And, and not, just, not just panel members who have experience. I mean, uh, I can say I'm, I, I learn every day uh, something new that, that perhaps I didn't know before. And, but I think certainly for the younger lawyers, uh, in that way, by getting the training, you get better lawyers involved uh, if they have adequate training and they do a better job. But if the funding is not there, not only for the younger lawyers, but even the ones that have been doing this for a long time, uh, we constantly need training. We constantly need updating uh, because not our entire practice, even though the majority of my practice is in federal court, uh, you know, we have to handle other cases as well. Uh, so I think the training, funding for training and training where you can get, where you can go through that training in the, in the jurisdiction in which you practice and not have to travel 2,000 miles to go to a, a week-long seminar, which is great if you can get into it, uh, but, you know, you leave behind your law office, 
Uh, so I think that is crucial, number one. And I think the, the increase in pay is crucial to keep the good lawyers that are on the CJA panel, to keep them on the panel. I think there needs to be a, a pay increase, uh, and I, I know that's been discussed, uh, just to keep the good lawyers and to attract the good younger lawyers to want to come on. I know, I think it's an honor to, to, to be a CJA panel lawyer. I didn't used to think that, uh, but I do now. And uh, I know a lot of lawyers feel the same way. Uh, and I, I hope that everybody that is a member of a CJA panel uh, has the same attitude. But in order to keep that attitude high, I think there has to be some, some better training and certainly uh, a, a higher pay rate scale uh, that is commensurate with you know, retained counsel, or at least maybe halfway commensurate with it. That's that's what I would urge this committee to consider. Probably, I, I agree with Richard on training, and there's got to be adequacy of funding. Um, I also echo what um, Mr. Morris said about independence. I think we've got to have that element and keep that at the forefront. And I think it was Judge LaGrange yesterday that talked about discouraging advocacy by withholding funds. That that really resonated with me, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it, it's it's just disheartening when we can't get what we need to defend the cases that uh, the, you know the public defenders are able to defend, the way the retained counsel is able to defend, and um, I think that's that's also got to be kept at the forefront of this. And thank you again for the opportunity. Ms. Morgan. Um, I think the only thing I want to touch on is um, the lack of uh, competent uh, capital habeas counsel. Um, that is a problem in our district. Um, our federal defender is trying to address it by recruiting some of us to um, take on that responsibility. The problem is when it is so infrequent, um, it is... It, it doesn't become cost effective to maintain that. Um, but then you are finding people who are thrown into um, really end stage, end stage litigation who don't have um, the extensive knowledge base that is required. And I think that's a huge issue that the CJA has to, has to take uh, a look at. Uh, thank you, Judge. I think uh, I agree that uh, training is probably one of the most important issues. Um, I, you know, I think, uh, there has, in some districts, a kind of a culture has developed about trying to do more with less, and uh, but that there really does need to be training, particularly on the use of experts, use of investigators, but also, uh, you know, for us to stay relevant uh, in terms of, of maintaining uh, our skills, you know, the, the number of appointments needs to stay um, uh, adequate, uh, you know, adequately high, as, um, as we mentioned, more than just one or two appointments a year. Uh, I think for, for attorneys to stay abreast of situations. Within the past 10 years, there have been so many changes uh, in terms of sentencing issues with Booker, with the Johnson case, with uh, the guidelines changes, uh, and, uh, and for the attorneys to be able to stay on top of those uh, additional training is, is needed at the local level. Well, thank you all for being here today. Um, I know, as I think we've heard a couple of times here, you are all in private practice and you were away from that during uh, this testimony, but we much appreciate it. Again, if you think of anything you didn't say, um, if you hear from other attorneys who have something that they want to say, we are soliciting comments. We want your comments, so please um, don't feel free to get in touch. Uh, thank you again, and we will resume in 15 minutes.